Let me get this started. So uh, today, uh, Gabby Palomo is going to be leading us in a discussion of Chapter 6, Workflow Scripts and Projects. Go ahead and take it away, Gabby. Okay, thank you. Hey, John, this is a relatively short chapter. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I'm gonna just get my chat window here, ready in case anyone has any comments. Okay, so chapter six is basically about um, the initial stages of when you're gonna start a project. So dealing with scripts and our studio projects. So the learning objectives here are first, uh, learn how to create scripts and understand all the script diagnostics associated with um, with what R Studio gives us, right? If anyone is working on R, then just R R, then I don't know what happens there. <laughs> then we're gonna learn how to create an R Studio project and why is it so easy um, to work like that, and it's it becomes very easy to share also uh, work with others, right? By using R Studio projects. Then we're gonna understand working directories in R Studio and the get wd function. And we're going to be able to differentiate between relative paths and absolute paths. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the here package, which is very, very handy when we're dealing with, with relative paths. So um, let's start. Let's begin. So to start with here, um, let's just begin with the very, 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 very basic. So you can work all of your analysis, you can do everything in the console, but then you're not recording it, right? You're not really getting a document out of this that you can then um, edit and remember what you did. So if you start with a script, then it's it becomes super easy. Or it could be a, an R Markdown project, it could be a quarter pro, a quarter document here on a, or an R Markdown document, I did those numbers. So for that, you can use the script editor instead of the console, especially for complex pipelines or graphics or very long analysis or a model or something like that. For that, we have two forms to do that or two ways to do this. You can go to file, new file, and then R script, or you can just type in command or control shift N and then it will pop up a new, um, a new script which then you can obviously save it using whatever um, we're going to talk about saving files and, then, and how to name your files too, but essentially whatever name you want and you will have the .r um, termination. How do you say that in English? The .r thing in the app and name file. Um, and then here's a little... Um, a little screen grab of how it looks like. Another thing that is um, that if you were going to talk about scripts, we can also talk about Paint's layout. So this is like the very, very basic layout of your RStudio uh, screen. So you essentially have four windows or panes that you can uh, switch around. around and essentially um, customize what exactly is in each one. So usually you're gonna have the source uh, pane here and then which is where your script is gonna go or your portal document or your art markdown document, whatever. Underneath it is gonna be your console and then the environment and the history and all of that is gonna be on the right side and then the files, the plots and the viewer is gonna be on the bottom right side. But you can switch them around. For example, for me, I find it very useful to have the source and the console right next to each other, but other people prefer to have the console underneath the script or the source. For me, it's, it's easier like this. And you can sort of customize this or um, edit how your paints are going to look like if you go to Tools and then Global Options, and then in the Paint Layout, you're going to you can uh, use the drop down menus to essentially say what goes in there, or you can just go to the um, wherever you see those four little panes on the top menu of the R of our studio, and then you just say pane layout, and then it will pop up this um, 
the, the pain layout um, screen. So the other thing that's also very useful here is um, to learn and to know the, um, the keyboard shortcuts to go to the script, to the console, or to the terminal, if you're using the terminal too. There are shortcuts for anything, right? But I essentially, for me, using the mouse, it becomes very, what's the word? Like, I feel like I'm losing time by doing this, and my mind even is like, where is my mouse, right? So it's super easy to just keep using your keyboard and forget about the mouse. So to do that, you the three ones that I, I know them by heart, right? but I recommend people to learn our control command one to put the, um, the focus on the script and then command or control two to move to the console. So then switching between those two, which is essentially uh, the two switches that we're making most often becomes super, super easy. And then if you need to use the terminal, it's alt shift M, which sometimes is very handy too, if you're using um, GitHub or something like that. Um, but yeah, but essentially there's a shortcut even for the viewer pane or the files or the plots, et cetera. But control one, control two are the ones that I use the most. Then, so you have your script and now uh, you entered some very cool code in it. What do you do? So remember to use control command enter to run the current um, line or, um, or the uh, expression that you want to move to the console or to evaluate in the console. So it's always control command enter, and then it will automatically move to the next expression that you want to evaluate um, or to the next code block. And then control command shift X to run the entire script. I always forget that one. So I have it, um, I have it here on a post-it uh, here in my on top of my desk, because I always forget that one. And I usually just do control A, control enter, when it's super easy to just do control shift S, right? But anyway, I always forget that one. Um, and always at the top of your script, or even if it's a photo or, a, or an R markdown file, always start with the libraries that you want to load or the packages that you want to load. Oh, that's another cool one. Control command shift B to run everything before your cursor. Ah, that's pretty cool. So that if you're like, let's say you want to um, run everything before like a ggplot or a graph that you're doing, but you want to make sure that everything else before it is uh, run before you do the graph, then you can do that one, right? Control command shift B, B4. I like that one. Good, good one, John. Um, so then what I was saying is that always at the beginning it's always like good practice to have maybe you want to put like a little title with like um with the hashtags or the pound signs and then underneath packages and then the packages that you want to load right so, so start that script or that photo or that r markdown file with that and avoid including install packages in a script because if you're going to share it with someone or at least comment them out but if you're going to share them with someone and you don't comment them out or you leave them there, you're going to um, cause the other person to make changes in their computer that they don't necessarily want to do. So let them decide for themselves, right? Um, then we have our study diagnostics that these things, you guys, are so useful. I don't know who came up with this because it's always a little comma. It's always that you're missing the last part of the um, of a bracket or like a parenthesis or something and nothing wrong. But because you have those piggly lines, you kind of see like, oh, there's something here that's not right. What am I missing? And then you can sort of pay attention to what it is. And then it, it also tells you what, what that can be, right? Like you are missing a parenthesis or an unexpected token here, like what we see here in the... Um, in the first example. So if you hover on over the little cross, it's going to tell you exactly what that issue is going to be. So those are very, very useful because it's always the comma somewhere that you're missing. It's always, or a plus sign. Oh my gosh. Yes, anyway. So then let's talk a little bit about saving and naming file. So this in on itself, 
even if if you're not a coder, I feel like the first day you're entering college or even anywhere that where you have to use the computer, they should teach this thing, like how to name files. Because um, every time I have given a class to undergrad, I, they always have issues naming files and they usually use, for example, um, spaces in between words, or they use like certain things that are not necessarily best practices when any files, if you will. So I feel like this is this is good, regardless if you're a coder or not. So anyway. So file names should be machine readable. So that means that the words that you're using in the name of the file should sort in a way make sense, right? And so that if you are searching with using the Explorer search or search bar or whatever other thing that Mac uses, which I don't know anything about Max, um, so then they should be able to reach it just by those keywords in or the words that are in the file. Okay. So avoid spaces, avoid any special symbols. Special characters don't rely on case sensitivity to distinguish files. Like the first one that starts with the capital letter, and then the other ones don't have it. Like no, that's going to cause issues. File names should be human readable. So use file names to describe what's in the file. If it's a figure, if it's like a exploratory analysis, if you're cleaning data, all those things can sometimes help. If it's a report, file names should play well with default ordering. So. Here, there are two things that can help. So one is to start the file name using numbers, but I always recommend using a zero before, because in case you want to go to 10 or 11 or something like that. Um, because if you go one, two, three, then it's going to be one, 10, 11, 12, right? So if you go zero, one, then those are the two digits that you that you have. So that's one of the... Uh, um, most common ways that I that I use to name my files, but the other one is to use dates. So start with the date where you received or where you started that um, that script or that file, that analysis. So you can start with the date and then use the description. So um, so when it's organized uh, in your um, file explorer or whatever it is that you're using, Mac or whatever, then it's gonna be it's gonna be in order of those dates, right? So this one, for example, if it's organized um, from least to highest or from lowest to highest, whatever, it's going to start with this one, which is in March, and then the other one that is going to be in um, in April, right? So that's always super handy, or I suppose it's a good, um, it's a good practice to have. Then there's so much more that we can talk about naming files, and I put here two um, two good links. The first one I'm going to put them on the chat too. So the first one is to um, uh, Jenny Bryan's talk on how to name files like a normie, which I love the name, but it, she gives very 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 good tips on how to. essentially do this that we're talking about here, right? Naming files, best practices, follow her advice. And this other one was put by the person that um, did this chapter before, but I went over it and it, it has very good advice. So I'm going to put it here too. Um, it goes through um, some good advice on naming conventions, yeah, for files. And one of the things that they say is to if you're working, for example, in a lab, like I am part of a lab. So make sure everyone in the lab follows the same convention. If you are working with um, a writing a script, writing a, a manuscript with other people, make sure everyone in your team is following the same naming convention so that everyone is on, on the same page. And John is giving a very cool tip that says, let's see if I can put it here. Um, I hope everyone can see it with the screen sharing. But if you're naming a bunch of things programmatically, which yes, then you can use stringer or string R package, and especially specifically the function str underscore pad. 
Um, and we can see more about this on chapter 14, but the general idea is to do, uh, to include, for example, if you want 20 files, so then say str path one to 20 with two, and then using the path zero, the path zero, so it's gonna be zero, one, zero, two, zero, three, blah, 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 all the way up to 20. So I'm gonna try that today, actually. So that's actually pretty, pretty good mm -hmm. advice. Thank you, John. Okay, so there's a lot that we can say about naming files. Someone wants to share something? Uh, I no, I thought someone. you were, I thought you were going to be sharing your screen and just wanted to let you know that, you know, we only see your browser. I thought you were going to try running it. So never mind. <laughs> oh, wait, what are you, wait, what are you seeing? No. You're seeing. No, we're seeing, we're seeing what you think, you know, we are seeing your browser, but I thought, I, I thought you were going to run something in our studio. And so that's, I unmuted and then didn't need to. So never mind. <laughs> Oh, well, we can try what you just said. I guess I, we have time. I, it's really, it's quick. I think everyone can run it, like, okay. you know, play with it yourself. Um, the important parts are the width, like that's how many digits. And then the pad character is zero if you're doing numbers. Yeah, so that means it's going to be zero, one, zero, two, or, or 20, right? So the numbers that yep. don't have two with right. two, then we'll have a zero, yeah. Okay, then I'll keep that in mind for if I need to share my screen. Um, okay, or my R student. Okay, so then naming file, moving on. Then let's talk about projects and R Studio projects. So let's start by just um, essentially making sure that everyone in their global options, when they go to the general tab of these global options, that you untick the workspace where it says restore R our data into workspace at startup so that it doesn't, um, so when you start an R Studio uh, project, it doesn't restore your R data, um, but which means it's essentially everything that you did before, it's stored in this um, file called .R data. And then you also say to never um, save that R data, right? So because you have everything that you need, stored in an R Studio project, which is what we're going to talk about now. So where is your analysis going to live? So you can always find a working directory or where everything is being stored. If you let, if you look at the console, uh, which is going to be whatever your console is, right? But at the top of that console, that is essentially where uh, it's going to tell you the, the, the path or the directory where you are currently at. And if you click on this little arrow, it's going to, uh, in the files pane, which is going to be on the right lower corner, it's going to essentially put, those, uh, put that directory right there. So that's very handy. Oh, what was that? Oh Sorry about that. <laughs> no. What if the other way that you can do this is in the console if you do get WD or get working directory. So that's gonna tell you the path, the absolute path of where your um of your where you are at the moment, right? There's another function called set WD or set working directory. So there so that you can change the working directory, but it's not recommended because it it can if you're not if you don't know what you're doing, it can create a lot of games here. So what everyone recommends are it's the best practices to use, or it's among the best practices to use when you're coding, is to use R Studio projects. So essentially, R Studio projects are self-contained directories or folders where all of your graphs, all your code, all your analysis, everything that you do is going to be housed there. And you don't have to worry about setting the working directory at the top because if you share this with anyone else, they essentially you can zip it and then email it to anyone or Slack it to anyone, and then they are going to have everything contained in the project. So all the path, all everything is going to be housed in that directory in that project. 
Um, so you can read a little bit more, and I put this. Um, essentially, I am obsessed with Jenny Bryan, so anything that she does, I'm, I'm gonna always link it here, <laughs> which I'm sure everyone is, but um, familiar with her work. But anyway, here you can find more about um, how she recommends to have this project-oriented workflow. Ah, oh, browse URL get WT. Let me try it because I have Windows. Let me see if I can do that. Um, browse URL get WT. Ah, and it opens up the um, what do you call this thing? The file, the directory. It pops up the directory where all where my project is essentially. Ooh, that's a nice tip. Yeah, Mac works too. Okay, great. That's a nice tip. I'm gonna start using it because again, if it saves me from using the mouse, I'm all about it. I like that tip. Okay. So then. Uh, so what is an R Studio project? Right. So first, we create a new project, and there are a couple of ways to do that. You can go to File and the New Project, and then follow the directions, or you can go to the top of your R Studio um, window, right? The, the top of the R Studio thing, and then you're gonna see where it says. Well, I was working on the chapter on the book club, so it already has the name of the of the project that I'm working on, but if not, it's going to say something else like empty project or no project or something like that. And then if you click there, you essentially have access to anything that you can think of to start a new project. So either a new project, open another project in a new session. If you have, if you were working on previous projects, you can have easy access to them here too, or you can um, close the project that you're currently working at. So that's a very handy tip to do if you want to avoid file the project. Um, so we click on new project here, and then you follow the steps, which are highlighted here in these um, screen graphs, where you are essentially picking between or choosing between a new directory or an existing directory, which means that if you didn't create a folder before where you want to house your uh, project, then you can go to new directory. But if you already created it, or if you want it to be a part of that, of an existing directory that you already created before, then you go to the second option, which is going to be the existing directory here. And if you are cloning something from um, GitHub, then you go to the third option. But then essentially, you're going to pick what kind of project you want, if it's just a regular one, a package, a shiny, all of those things that we're not doing right now, but essentially you're going to choose, choose the first option, which is a new project, and then you're going to name it and make sure that it's on the subdirectory that you want, right? And you have other options too, which is create a Git repository associated with this, or you can open in a new session so that if you're working on a on something here, and then you want this to be a new session, like open up as a new session, then you can also do that in case you were working on something else. The use RENV with this project, I have no idea what that is. I think it's not, I don't know, it's very specific. Um, if anyone knows, if it's relevant, please put it in the chat. Otherwise, I don't even know. Hey, as in Dante Alighieri, that, oh my God. Okay, yeah, okay, let's move on. Uh, we won't talk about friends. Okay. Oh, Dante. Okay. Let's see Dante. Is he there? Oh my gosh, look at him. Dante. I'm sorry. It's a rule that if you have pets in a Zoom session, then you have to show them. So sorry about that. He's super cute. Yeah. Let's click on that puppy. Okay. Anyway, let's move on. So here we have created a new project and we are ready to start working. So, so um, 
also, also a good thing to keep in mind is that how we work with relatives and absolute paths, even either if you're a Mac or a Linux user or a Windows user like myself. So a relative path is gonna be relative to the working in directory, which is gonna be essentially the project, uh, whatever it is that you're housing, your project, your RStudio project. And the absolute path is going to point out to the place in your computer, right? So it's going to include your username, your document file, or whatever it is that you're um, uh, saving all this, uh, all this information. So the thing to keep in mind is if you're a Mac user or a Linux user, then it's going to use forward slash. No, that's backslash, right? I always confuse that too. So that's the backslash, right? So the Windows uses uh, forward slash, I think it is. And I don't know why the note said that it had two backslash, two forward, no, wait, it's already there, backslash, yes. Two backslashes, but in my Windows, it only has one. So I don't know what is what was up with, with those two slashes. But anyway, uh, apparently Windows is fine with the Mac slash. Is that the forward one? I I never can remember which one is which. Um, okay, but my windows, and I can show you, actually, you can actually see that here on the top. So my, I, here it uses the, let's call it the max slash, but when I go to my file, it does use the other one. Okay, so that's the forward slash. Okay, so when, so, so I, I don't know what's up with that. Windows. Anyway, um, the point of all of this is make sure you understand the way your computer works, if you're a Mac user or if you're a Windows user. Um, okay, John put something on the chat Act to normalize the path that you are working with. I don't know. I never have those two slashes. So those two backslashes, I don't know. Why people, it's, some people have them and some others now. You, you do if you see it as a character. So in, uh, in a character string, the backslash is for special characters. So like, I think slash, I don't think slash capital U is anything, uh -huh. but some of them are things. And so in order to put them into a character string, you need an extra backslash. And that makes it work as just a single backslash. So, because otherwise that backslash gets used as a special character. Uh, for example, okay. slash slash n is a new line in a in a string. Um, again, I mean, like I, I use normalize path, which is the built-in R function for normalizing, and it does makes it different on Windows versus Linux and Mac. But Windows doesn't care, so just always use forward slashes. Um. But when you do something like okay. normalized paths, Perfect. sometimes it'll put in the backslashes and that makes things confusing, but just use forward slashes. <laughs> yeah, or even better, use the here package. So we are uh, gonna talk yes. about that right now. <laughs> so, this, so this package here or here package, I suppose, I don't know, however it is that you say that. So this package is super handy. And for the longest time, I couldn't understand what it did. But once it clicked, it was like, oh, yes, I don't have to worry about those slashes. I don't have to worry about any of those silly things as long as I know what the names of the directories and the name of my file are. So this package here uh, helps with easy file referencing and building file paths so that you can rest easy and not even worry about the forward slashes and the backslashes and all of the Mac and Linux. And we don't care because here package does that for you. So if you install the package, obviously, first with install packages here, then you're going to, you can use the function just here and then parentheses and empty parentheses to see the top level directory of where you are, which is essentially get WD, right? And then if you want to cr create the path 
for a specific file, then what you can do is just put in here, in quotes, the, for example, if it's this file.txt that I want to build a path to, the relative path to, and it's housed inside the, the, uh, um, uh, the directory or whatever folder it is in, let's say it's called there, then that's all I need to know so that I can put here the first folder that it's in. If there's a second subfolder, then I put the other folder in separated by commas and inside quotes, and then finally the name of the file. So then what it's going to do, it's going to create or it's going to give me the path with the slashes that you don't even have to worry about that. So for example, if we're reading, let's say you're reading this file called your file.csv and you're using the function read CSV to do that. And that file is housed inside the directory called directory or inside a folder called directory. You can do that instead of copying here the directory. You can just use a here, here, or just here, if you already loaded the library, with the name of your first directory where it's housed and then the name of your file. So it becomes super, super, super handy um, that you don't have to worry about those slash. And then that, that's it. That is all we have to discuss here. The other thing that I thought we might um we might talk about because these are the exercises, but really, I don't, it's just everyone can just go to see these files to these two clip links and then sort of um, see the tips that they like and that they things that they didn't know before, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, one thing that I think we can also talk about that I don't know, sometimes I find myself thinking about these things is that. When you create your package, what folders do you put in them so that you can or keep organizing your project? So for example, for me, I always start with a data folder, a figures folder that I sometimes call it big. I always have an R folder where I put my script, but sometimes that R folder is gonna be like uh, divided into several subfolders. I also always keep like a second uh, directory or second folder where that's called tables, where I put all the tables that I create, they go there so that it's easy for me to just have the figures and the tables separate. Um, if I have any shape files too that I'm working with. So those are um, some of the, the way that I organize my RStudio packages, but I've seen people do also um, data cleaning. So they have a specific folder for data cleaning which is different from the data with, because the data folder is going to have all your CSV files. I also like your raw um, data files, right? And then, uh, then that's it, that's it. That's all I have. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that last thing or anything else. Yeah, I um, often also use an SRC folder for the scripting for to contain the code, which refers oh. to the source. Yes. So what do you put in there, SRC? Yeah, you can store uh, R scripts, uh, for example, or just uh, R markdown files. Uh, but sometimes it's also used to contain non-R codes I've seen, uh, especially in R packages, for example. Yeah, those already have like their own structure. Um, so John put a comment here. I work mostly in packages which have a standard directory structure. Yeah, so yeah. So the packages are gonna have a, a specific and standard directory structure so that's that's good but for my manuscripts for example um when i am um, so i create a an um a project for a manuscript because I'm, I'm an ecologist right so i'm gonna if i'm gonna um work on this manuscript that i want to publish it then i usually follow the same um sort of the same uh data um 
what do you call the project structure, if you will, because I necessarily I'm going to need the data, the figures, the tables, the maps that I produce, etc. So that's um, so that's very specific. I've never seen anyone like say this is the structure that you need for a manuscript, essentially, right, or for this other thing, other than for packages. So I guess um, maybe we can adopt some of that structure from the our packages too. But I, I just I don't know. It's a it's a little bit of what I need for that manuscript. So yeah. I want to ask for some suggestions. Um, so yeah. like if you uh when you do like some updates in your maybe like a previous ask brief, I don't know if there's any way to manage these files uh, locally. I know like if you do uh, upload your files at GitHub, you can like add explanations of what is being updated, but for locally, like I want to know if anyone have suggestions like how you manage those like update or revise screen so you know what you did in the past or which versions of screen you should use for the certain purpose. Well, I don't have any useful tips for that because I have always had the same question, Lily. But I don't know if John Flores or someone else has any advice on that. Okay. Oh, let me so rephrase it again. Yeah. yeah. So, sorry. Uh. So. Um. When you have like uh, many different versions of your R scripts, for example, like you have you figure out you have to update something in your previous script, so you will create the like version two of this particular R script. But I don't know if there's any better way to manage these like the revisions locally. Since I know like if you do this on GitHub, you can add explanations about what you ate in this version of script. But for locally, the only thing I can think about is you have like a text file saying this version has a certain update and this version has certain update. But I don't know if you guys have any tips about that. Okay, I, I can comment on it. Uh, of course, uh, John put as well. Um, yeah, uh, the tip of John is to use the use git function of uh, the use this package. Um, so essentially, um, the version control, it is not limited to the online GitHub infrastructure. You can run Git locally. It is actually the, the basic way to use Git. It is to do local version control and you can push it to the repository on GitHub. So you, you have to make the connection. So you can set up in uh, RStudio the connection between the local um, Git repository and uh, the remote uh, Git repository. Um, so you, you you can do the same. So uh, locally as in uh, GitHub directly. So normally you would do it, do it locally, make new commits every time, which reflect the versions uh, which you refer to, and then push those to GitHub, for example, which you can also use to collaborate on with other people. Okay, thank you. Yes, I think, I'm not sure even, I don't think in this book, version control is being discussed, but there are several books in which it is uh, being discussed, of course. There is uh, Happy Git with R, uh, for example, from, uh, I think, Jenny Bryan. Um, perhaps we should uh, add the link in the chat, I think. But um, that's a good one, I think. Thank you. Wow. We have never done a book club of that. Um, I'm just gonna ask. We do... So we did that um, a few weeks ago. Yes, we should do one, John. Please. So we did the um, what they forgot to teach you about R, um, which is this, and that uh, includes Happy Git or a little bit of Happy Git with R, but I've never actually done read the whole book, so. Um, 
okay. that might be interesting. Do I, I do know that book hasn't been updated in quite a while, and I don't know. Well, actually, it has been, but I, I don't know how much like the whole book is needed by most people. Um, I'll, I'll look into that though. But yeah, in general, um, like there are some really simple baseline things that you can learn to be a lot happier with your Git or with your version control, um, which is part of what I try to encourage here that if you do slides, you know, we have the repo and I walk you through the basics of getting set up. Um, and then there's always more. Um, I know that there's a lot of things I'm not great with uh, with Git and I use Git every day. So um, there's always more to learn. But yeah, uh, I, I do recommend learning just the very base, the basic level of working with Git because um, it lets you uh, fix things that you screw up is the main thing. And one of the really nice things about working, especially with GitHub, is if something just goes nuts with your local copy of something I, I do this every once in a while if i have i don't know if something has is weird you just delete it and start over because it's all stored on github if you do it with github so you can just you know completely delete your local copy it doesn't really do anything any harm as long as you've been checking things back in um so that's definitely something i recommend and yeah we will either we'll do that book club or i will push for more uh, iterations of the one that's that kind of in, includes it um but yeah watch out for that um and if you ever have questions um we do have a, a channel on slack just for um git and github and that kind of thing um it's in there it is let me get this that's um it is that um and yeah, there's uh, lots of um, options. Is that the, um, who is this one? Is this um, Bruno? Yeah, Bruno Rodriguez. Um, there are so many, like, it can go so deep with reproducibility uh, that the author of that other book, the um, Reps with R, dev book there uh has been really working on this other system called mix uh that like you can reproduce your entire machine effectively um like it it wraps it up really nicely uh so that anyone else running your code is running it exactly like you run your code i haven't gotten that far yet um but yeah <laughs> we will so we'll talk about things like here working with relative paths instead of absolute paths some of the baseline stuff to for reproducibility uh, but we aren't really going to get into um version control here um at all <laughs> i was trying to look through i think yeah the the other workflow chapter is just about getting help i think so um yeah <laughs> but I, I definitely recommend yeah, I you know, uh, just that there's the um setup instructions on the repo for if you're going to edit slides i um really do recommend going through all those steps and making sure that you're doing that process um and then uh from there you know slowly learn but you can learn just little bits it doesn't have to be scary. And you can use GitHub or GitLab even for private things. A lot of businesses use it, but even if not, you can set up um you can set up private repositories. Uh but even if you don't use the online ones, you can use local Git just to keep versions locally. It's definitely like I definitely recommend that sort of system a lot over uh you know, final version 01, final version 02, really final version, you know, don't do it. I don't recommend that. I recommend keeping uh, version control. Um, you also can see as the thing that I pasted, I, I still also back everything up to Dropbox, which can cause 
uh, issues actually. I have to pause Dropbox while I'm working because otherwise sometimes our studio and Dropbox have fights. Um, one of these days, I will probably just stop that because if you're working with GitHub, you don't really need Dropbox, but it's an old habit that is dying hard. Um, but that's a way to do a very, very simple level of um, version control. It's not like it, it keeps, it, 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 there are ways to roll things back with Dropbox, but not as nicely as with Git. So, um, yeah. And something, I don't know how much of that we'll talk about it here, but um, for our packages, uh, there's a section or a whole bunch of chapters in that book about testing things. And there's, I don't remember if they use the language or not, but it, the purpose of tests is to let you not be afraid to screw things up. And it's that's also the purpose of version control is then you can experiment. You're not gonna break it. You have it controlled, you have the old version and it speeds things up because you don't have to constantly be worried about something breaking. Um, so uh, definitely recommend. <laughs> I will stop blathering on about that now. <laughs> Oh, please, John, we're always happy to hear you say and guide us into the right direction. At least I am. Um, guide us into the light. All of us that are in the darkness here with all the things that we need to learn. Anyway, um, so yeah, 2024 resolution. I like that, Lily. Yeah, let's explore more about Git. Get local Git, at least, because GitHub is sort of, I do use that. I don't understand it 100%, but that private local git, I don't know anything about. So yeah, 2024 resolution, I like that. So whenever you are um, okay. working on like a, a pull request for, um, you know, for this book, for example, for the notes, you are working in private git until that moment when you do PR push. Because until then you're, you just have a local copy you are you make a branch locally you're checking things in locally and then at the end you push it up to github but until then you're working locally and in, instead of pushing it to github you could locally merge it into your main branch and that's how it works if you want to um, constantly oh and you don't have to work in a branch at all you can always work in main that's a common way to start but i really recommend always work in a branch it's easy to Say, oops, nope, never mind, and get rid of that thing you were working on and go back to the original or the, you know, how it was before you started looking with it. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I think I, I need to actually play with it, like actually have a, because I feel like I'm one of those people that if I read, it it makes sense but until i do it it won't click so i need to like sort of do it but yeah 2024 resolution like really we are going to get our minds in 2024 <laughs> and uh well if if not i don't know if anyone else has anything else to say about this package if not then we will Oh, we didn't start it and we didn't end it. I'm so sorry, John. I forgot about starting. Oh, it. no, I started and, um, but, uh, you know, we're still talking, so it's fine. End is just, end is when we're actually done. And it's because every once in a while, someone stays logged in and the meeting just keeps recording and they're walking around and who knows what they might be saying on their microphone or whatever. So don't. Don't stress out about clicking or saying that right. until the that very, very don't end. need to go into the YouTube video. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So I'm working on chapter yeah. seven. I think I'm going to have it done so that I can push it to the GitHub repo um, in a few minutes because I'm already almost yeah. at the end. So that awesome. we can be ready and presenting chapter seven again. And then if that, there's no thing else to add, then we'll end this. And okay. we can be next week. All right. I will see everyone uh, here in a week.
Bye. Thank you. Have a good day.